Nest webinar. This one is entitled Australia's Tech Advantage, How is Technology Transforming Businesses and the Economy? It's set to be an incredible discussion with three unbelievable experts. My name is James Preston. I'll be your moderator for today's event. And just before we start the session, let me just inform everyone that this webinar is for informational purposes only. It's not a solicitation or recommendation to buy, sell or hold the stock of the company or any companies that do get mentioned or engage in any investment activity under discussion, which I know will be quite interesting given with James, for example, that is all about trading. But again, this is just for your information. So let's kick off today's webinar on Australia's tech advantage. Technology is changing the way we live and work in ways we could not predict just a generation ago. AI, blockchain and quantum computing are the new buzzwords presenting significant opportunities for people, businesses and the broader economy. As we emerge from the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, a thriving digital economy is critical to Australia's overall economic recovery. And to discuss Australia's tech advantage, today we have with us three incredibly valued clients of Calkine, so Aerologix PTY Limited, James Australia, and also Zenfi. And representing these respective companies, the co-founder at Aerologix, Mr. Rakesh Rotu, CEO and founder of James Australia, Mr. Tui Edwera, and CEO of Zenfi PCY Limited, Vahid Taslimi. So I welcome all of our incredible experts and our lovely guests today. But let's start with our first speaker. It is, of course, co-founder of Aerologics, Mr. Rakesh Rotu. And Rakesh founded Aerologics with Tom Kasker during their MBA studies at the Australian Graduate School of Management. Rakesh is also known for being a co-founder of another drone tech company, R2 Robotronics. Now, that was a very successful venture as a bagged several awards such as finishing in the top eight at the World Startup Expo. He's also built a UAV traffic management system as well. There's almost nothing that he can't do and just to prove that he's also been an officer cadet in the Australian Army Reserves. So certainly we don't want to mess with him. We don't want to mess with his tech either. Now Aerologix is one of the fastest growing drone networks and aerial imaging solutions providers in the country. It's driven by the mission to eliminate the gap between licensed pilots and its clients' aerial mission through an expansive, intelligent network. And Aerologix is gaining enormous grounds in the industry and essentially acts as an Uber for drones in many ways, providing the latest cutting-edge technology to support a large distribution network of on-demand drone pilots and its clients all at the click of a button. And so with that, I now invite Mr. Rakesh Rotu to start enlightening all of us. Rakesh, welcome to the virtual stage. Thank you, James. Thank you for the kind intro and pleasure to be here. Um, I will be sharing my screen. Um, Aerologics, you know, mission statement is we are uh, mission control for drones. So um, started, um, you know, Tom, that's my co-founder and myself. We met during the MBA brief intro. Con uh, Tom has been an ex-contest pilot for 10 years. Um, he had a previous drone tech company called AeroLens. Um, and uh, myself, a uh, previous drone tech startup called R2 Robotronics, um, started that in India uh, about six years ago, won many awards. And um, in one way, you know, six years ago, drones, you could imagine mostly uh, military, but we have come a long way, which I think ties beautifully to the topic as well in terms of technology disruption, um, some of the highlights is um, we have, you know, large contracts with uh, big telcos. Uh, we have patents, uh, won many awards. We um, completed the uh, prestigious UNSW Founders 10X program, got the MVP grant um, two years ago uh, from NSW government. And most recently, um, the first Australian company to be approved, both the apps, Android and iOS, part of the uh, CASA, which is the Civil Aviation Safety Authority's Digital Sky, together uh, with other um, big companies such as AirMap, Google Wing, GE, OK2Fly. Okay so um, what that means is, as a drone pilot, you uh, you know download our app, you know with Android or iOS, and at the click of a button, you actually 
have the entire airspace information on where you can or can't fly your drone. Uh, just at a high level, you know, drones could be used for simple things such as visual media, capturing um, in aerial imagery, videos to doing complex um, aerial survey inspections for telecommunication uh, clients, um, utilities, uh, to much more complex um, outputs such as 3D model or CAD model. Um, usually drones, you think of it as, yes, you know, it's a flying camera, but the data that is generated, um, it can be used to create uh, you know, 3D models or the CAD models, which could be highly valuable for uh, some of our clients, wherein, you know, just sitting in the office, they are able to visualize, you know, the digital twin, um, for example, telco, you know, what's up there on the telecommunication tower, what's inside the, um, uh, the cabin. So that is a huge value add because it saves you just sitting in the office, don't even have to go visit uh, and you know, multiple uh, team members in, in the company can just at the click of a mouse able to visualize this entire data set. Um, so you know, just briefly talked about it, wherein is a growing need. Uh, that's because of a couple of reasons. One is the cost of the drones has come down considerably. For example, at Aerologics office, um, we have a drone which Tom purchased about five years ago, um, costing about 40, 50 grand. Uh, and the capabilities now you can actually get in a $500 drone. So you can see the transformation that happened in the last four or five years, where you know, the cost of the drones has come down. Uh, another thing is the deregulation. Uh, governments across the, you know, across the world they have realized the importance of uh, the, the drones and then maybe five years ago, something like a market like India, where my previous startup was based out of, uh, you literally can't fly a drone. You need to go to an nearest uh, police station, tell them, whereas just a couple of months ago, they have deregulated the entire market. Anybody can go and fly a drone, except obviously, you know, within the rules, such as, you know, you can't fly near military areas and all of that. But it just talks about how everyone has realized the importance um, of uh, in these drones. And at the same time, you have thousands and thousands of drone hobbies or pilots who like to fly drones as a hobby, maybe on the weekend or every day, you know, they're just going on a holiday, take the drone out. So what we want to do with, at Aerologics is build this platform wherein we are connecting clients that are looking for on-demand drone data they want data right now with, on the other side, you have these drone hobbies or pilots and who would like to monetize their free time, their uh, equipment that they have already uh, purchased. So that's, you know, Aerologics, we call it as Uber for drones, um, you know, build this platform, connecting clients with the pilots. That being said, we also have free apps, both iOS and Android for, our drone pilots, we check their licenses, their skill type. Also, we have patents on our technology, uh, most notably the Aeropath or the 3D flight navigation feature where the drone um, automatically takes over and uh, captures the data, let's say around a telecommunication tower. So, you know, why, you know, uh, the usage of drones is increasing. So, you know, previous methods, a lot of time was wasted. You know, you need to find the, the pilot with the right equipment. The clients would go into maybe groups or Google, hey, I need a drone pilot here. So for them, they want the data right now. Don't, don't want to talk to these pilots or find pilots and talk about the cost, their skill level, not even sure what they're getting at. Um, and once you have that, and another problem you have for the clients is, uh, yeah, the cost as well as the quality, right? You don't know what is the output going to look like. 
And then, you know, you're not sure about the qualifications, the licenses that this pilot have. We don't know whether what they're claiming to be is right. Okay, and um, that's where, you know, we build this on-demand ordering of projects. And um, we have Aeropath, which is the automation of the flight path. Uh, the drone takes over, the, the pilot goes to that location, connects the app with the drone they have, uh, which is, you know, talking about the consumer drones, just, you know, could be like a $500 drone that you get at JB Hi-Fi. We're not talking about complex drones. Um, and then we have built this platform wherein um, for the clients, they get data, they're able to uh, visualize the data. They're, we have a running timeline of, um, the project status from when the, um, the pilot has accepted the project all the way to when he or she is flying to the date when the data is uploaded. So, you know, the, you know, just briefly mentioned about the same, you know, um, uh, the pilot gets the mission details, uh, he signs up and Aeropath uh, takes over the, the navigation. So, you know, endless uh, opportunities um, in different industries, whether we're talking about teleco, renewables, um, government councils, um, real estate, insurance, the, you know, it's possibilities are endless. So just briefly about us, I uh, started two and a half years ago, but myself and Tom, we have a previous uh, drone tech background. Uh, it's like, a culmination of two companies, uh, two robotronics and uh, AeroLens, which Tom co-founded, uh, won many awards, or an AFR, uh, venture backed. Um, we were uh, the global finalist in the Infra Challenge competition. We went to China, we were top 15 startups. Um, yeah. So, you know, just to relate to the topic, you know, we are revolutionizing the way the drone data is captured. The, the way drone data is available on demand. Um, at the same time, we are uh, providing indirect employment opportunities to you know, hundreds and thousands of these drone hobbies of pilots, like a gig economy, wherein they're not looking for a full-time job, they love flying drones, but they want one avenue wherein they get regular opportunities to uh, maybe you know, go and undertake a couple of missions. There are a couple of uh, 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 partnerships that we are yet to announce, quite game changing. Uh, please look out, um, follow you know, Aerologics, we're going to announce soon. But I think in Australia, we are just in a, such a beautiful spot, you know, wherein we can test, um, incubate, uh, you know, some of this technology before, you know, we actually get this scalable model that we can replicate um, around the world. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Wonderful. Rakesh, thank you so much for that. Really interesting stuff. I, I know recently there was a story, uh, I think up in the mid-north coast of one of the, the backpackers having a little trek through the bush getting lost and they had to use the, the Surf Life Saving Club there. They were, they were the only people that actually had a drone available to try and track these people down. The police didn't have it. The fire department didn't have it. So, uh, you know, there's so many different avenues that, the kind of things that you're doing, especially when you can sort of order one on demand can be used for. It's really quite incredible. Thank you. And myself and Tom, it's not just about commercial model. We want to actually give back to the community. We are mm. building this entire drone ecosystem, you know, drone hobbies, pilots, who actually want to, yeah, give back to the community too. For example, in search and res res rescue missions, um, you know, there are numerous instances where people getting lost um, and, Helicopters, they, yeah, because of the dense population and all of that, it's expensive too, right? It's taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. Whereas imagine you have, you ping one of the, uh, whether it's surf life saving or aerologics pilots, and somebody, you know, just bring the drone up and um, you find that missing person. Um, you, know, you, you can't put a cost to that. No, not at all. That is for sure. And I think that is actually a, a good little segue to one of the questions we've got here from Ray who's asking, can you please tell us how drone operators can join your network and how they can get paid? Great. So um, two ways. One is either um, you can 
go to one of the stores, whether it's Android or iOS, download our app, um, fairly self-explanatory, sign up, provide um, details such as your ARN, which is aviation uh, you know, reference number, which just takes like less than two minutes to sign up. Where in Casa, they want to know who you are as a person, you know, so that if anything goes by, they can check with you. Um, uh, that being said, you have other licenses. Some of the drone pilots have uh, REPL or REOC, more advanced. Um, so that's one way, or you can go on to our website um, you can, you, there's a login button, you sign up. And how do you get paid uh, once we verify your licenses? Whenever, um, the most important thing here, here is to know where you live. We don't want to know exactly your, uh, right down to your <laughs> home address. It could be just a suburb so that it's actually easier like this Uber concept wherein a client has a demand, uh, you know, project which is you know, on-demand data. Let's say, you know, um, for example, in Sydney, um, let, let's say Bondi, um, and then we ping to the pilots surrounding or living in, in the Bondi area. Actually, the pilots can also, um, there's a 300 kilometer radius that they can choose to travel if they want to, or, you know, based on the, their preferences, you get ping projects, uh, you either accept, once you accept, it's up to the client to allocate because the client also look for other things such as your skills, uh, the cost. And once uh, the project is allocated, you go undertake the project, um, fly, capture the data using our platform. Then um, we check for the data just to do a bit of a QA so that the client is happy and then you get paid. Another thing uh, with us uh, or as an aerologics pilot is you get paid within two business days once that data has been approved, which usually is unheard of. You need to wait for sometimes one month, two months to get paid. Wow. So is that what we're typically seeing with the likes of Ola and Uber? Is it about a month turnaround from completion of the work to being paid? I think with Ola and Uber, it's weekly. Um, or, you know, yeah, because I do tend to, whenever I'm catching, I tend to ask them, hey, how's it, their experience, the drivers? I mean, that's how you learn, right? Um, yeah. and they're paid weekly whereas with us it's you know two business days sometimes it's even quicker wonderful nice sharp short sweet that's what we all like to see for uh signing up to the platform a few other questions coming in here as well from thomas he says hi rakesh today there are several firms dedicated to providing drone data solutions how is aerologix different as compared to your other peers sure so um how we are different, one is we have built this um, aero park, which is a navigation feature. So probably, uh, I think this question can be interpreted whether how you are different as a client or how you are different as a pilot, right? Mm -hmm. So probably I'll address both. You know, as a client, how we are different is, you know, we have built this aero park, which is easier for the pilots to go capture data around complex structures such as telecommunication towers, usually you need high skilled uh, pilot with you know lots of hours flying. It's really difficult sometimes with the radiation interference, we don't want to bump into these uh, towers for, you know. Um, so we have built this uh, patented navigation feature. Second thing is we are actually growing by leaps and bounds, especially with this airspace uh, information that we are providing once we integrated with CASA. Um, and uh, you have, you know, pilots everywhere, like on demand, right? Whether you want uh, data in Darwin or even remote. Last week, we had a client who actually was uh, asking if you have a pilot uh, in remote Western Australia, which is, I think, about, I can't remember the name, about seven hours from Perth. Um, we, we have a pilot and then we are able to, uh, for one of the big clients, able to service, you know, him. It's the whole concept of on demand data, right? Now, if, if you're a pilot, how are we different is, as I said previously, um, you get paid within two business days once the data you know, uploaded, we have accepted the data. Uh, second thing is you have other apps um, on, the, on, you know, on, on the platform wherein maybe they are giving airspace information, but you don't get ping projects, right? How Aerologics is different is we are developing the entire drone ecosystem wherein we are giving pilots numerous opportunities. Uh, we yet to announce another partnership wherein you can um, sell your stock footage. Um, 
you can get pinged projects near where you live. You can check for airspace information and there's just so many more that we are yet to announce, um, which that's how we are different from others. Rakesh, the question I've got myself is, is how do you get out there? How do people know exactly what Aerologix is doing? Is it um, a lot of SEO? Is there a significant amount of marketing push? How exactly do we, do we find out about you in the first place? Yeah, so that's a great question, which is, it's been to now mostly, you know, just, you know, socials and word of mouth. We haven't actively uh, engaged anyone or did SEO. Um, because most of the, I mean, if you can think about it, we have the largest network. We released our app maybe an, exactly a an year ago. We mm -hmm. set up Aerologics uh, two years ago, and we have the largest network of drone pilots. It's, you know, we are touching nearly 1,700. Um, wow. Some of the other competitors who have been in the space for six, seven years, they have like claim about, you know, they have pilots of 800, 900, and it's only increasing. Uh, so we haven't done any SEO, but yeah, we would we would like to so that people are aware um, of Aerologics. And that's why I mean, you know, sessions like this, you know, Calcan Media, thank you. You know, people know, <laughs> people know about Aerologics. Um, yeah, um, uh, you know, Casa Digital Sky, wherein we integrated with airspace information. And that's actually been one of the biggest drivers because we our app is actually listed on the CASA, the government website, and Aerologics is right on the top just because maybe Aero is alphabetically. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and I think, you know, people are realizing, you know, who Aerologics is, they're knowing, but I think there's also so much we can do uh, to let, you know, let us out there and let the public know about Aerologics. I think that's a pretty good question here from Iris as well, who wants to know what you would say the most prominent and interesting projects have been undertaken using the Aerologics platform. Great. So uh, without going into really specific because of the, you know, the confidentiality, we had one client, overseas client. Um, they're not even present in Australia, but then they are doing a due diligence on one of the projects. Um, during one of the big uh, five, I think about two or $3 billion sale, um, they, they just basically wanted to know what the client is claiming actually exists because they are overseas. So within one week, we actually went and mapped um, about 70 sites and they were all over Australia. So within one week, we actually mapped 70 sites the client really happy, overseas, US based, don't even have to visit uh, Australia. Mm -hmm. They got data on demand, perfect example. Um, it was quite challenging for us because you know we had to reach out to the pilots, hey, you know, different locations. But that's how we are different too, wherein there are heaps of pilots, you know, who are willing to you know, go and capture the data for us. A giant project like that, how much does that usually cost something of that scale? Is that quite pricey? Uh, not really, usually in hundreds of dollars. Uh, oh. We're not talking about thousands uh, per site. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. And final one here from Chris, who says, Aerologics offers live streaming of assets to clients from any time and anywhere. Which industries can benefit from the valuable real-time aerial insights? Is it is it every industry just about? So uh, that is um, is nearly um, beta. So we're yet to uh, you know release that feature. But yeah, I mean that is another great value add for um, any client. Could be inspections, right? They're sitting in, a, in their office um, and then without even visiting. Like, like previously, how I said, you know, they don't even have to go and physically fly over or travel, but then they can get one of our pilots to go bring the drone up. Um, and we build this technology wherein while the drone is actually flying, the client sitting in the office could be anywhere in the world can see the live stream in the office. And Pretty another cool. thing we have built is they can actually talk to the pilots by actually texting him, we call it as aero text, wherein, hey, can you actually stop there? Or can you actually, I just want to look a little closer. Can you turn a little left your camera? 
So this is something really game changing for a lot of um, clients. Look, I tell you what, we had some health professionals on the other week who were potentially talking about putting those little stethoscopes down into the body, a slight little turn left, where's the liver, but we can do that with your <laughs> technology as well. So that's all extremely exciting. Rakesh, that's, uh, that's all the questions we've got for you for now. So thank you so much for My presentation pleasure. and answering those. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Rakesh. And if you do have a question, you didn't want to get it light answered right now, maybe you want to have a bit of a think about it still, easy way to do that. Just send us an email, info at calkindmedia.com and you can get any specific questions you'd like Rakesh to answer. We'll pass them on and, and we'll get those uh, back probably as quick as it takes to, uh, to pay one of your drone pilots, I'd imagine, about two days. So nice and sharp there as well. So Rakesh, <laughs> final time, thank you so much for presenting for us. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Well, let's grab one of Rakesh's drones and we'll uh, head on over to Surrey Hills and take a look at growing fintech James. Now this has been founded by Tui Edwera and uh, Tui also acts as the CEO of the company. He's a highly successful and accomplished businessman whose vision led to the formation of the powerful tech offering of James. Not to be confused with the powerful James on your camera right now, of course. But Mr. Edwera is also a transformational leader who has developed a career on building and advancing high growth projects across technology and financial services sectors. He's got a proven track record of delivering substantially improved performance and business results for key business stakeholders. And James, the company itself is a financial services technology company that offers a revolutionary automated online trading application by the same name of James. Now, James aims to make calculated trades on behalf of the users by automatically analyzing and predicting trades using a sophisticated artificial intelligence algorithm. James is powered to analyze more than 10 million pieces of data every single day across 1,000 different global stocks in the ASX 200, the FTSE, the S&P 500, and more. And moreover, James automatically buys and sells shares, which then, of course, eliminates the emotion associated with making trading decisions yourself. So to take us through the finer points and hopefully to remove a bit of the emotion in doing so is Tui Edwera. Tui, thank you so much for joining us today. No problem, James. I think you've just done my presentation. You've just told everyone <laughs> the company. <laughs> All good, though, because we're here to talk about, obviously, technology transforming businesses. Well, hi, guys. Um, my name's obviously Tui. I'm the CEO and founder of James. Uh, we're an automated AI investing app, um, pretty much to what James introduced us. Um, I thought before we, we sort of jump into James, um, I think it's really important that we obviously understand the transformation of technology in the financial services sector. And because obviously we're a trading app, I'll probably more relate what we've seen, the advancements in technology and how it's actually transformed the share trading finance sector. So a brief history, obviously, where we've come from is that we, the first exchange was in the 1600s, Dutch East India Company. Uh, we then saw the transition to obviously the London Stock Exchange, the first dedicated marketplace to trade stocks. And then we, and that was basically more that traditional way that we're, we're seeing on the trading floor, a bit similar to what you see the New York Stock Exchange. But in 1970s is when we really started to see the influence of technology into markets. And that was uh, driven by NASDAQ. So they were the first electronic trading uh, using automated networks of computers. And that really um, enabled us to not have to be on the trading floor to make trades where trades could be done obviously in the office. And that was obviously the, the really early stages of internet and the influence of internet uh, in markets. And then we, we sort of we saw that 1980s come along. Um, we moved to you know broadening out electronic fund trading and and trading to where we are today, uh, 2020, where there's an assortment of securities that you can trade, obviously from options, commodities, currencies, through to stocks. But the key chain, the key thing you can see here over the last 400 years is that technology has really been the catalyst for that change in the sector. And I, th I think for the everyday investor or the everyday people like us, we, we haven't really seen that technology ourselves until probably about 1990s when um, the internet really came into our lives. And we really started in what we call Web 1. Uh, I'm sure you guys would remember dial up uh, when you'd have to obviously dial into the internet. Um, and that was very early days of, uh, visual, of, of a visualization of the internet. 
Um, Netscape um, we were very early in emailing um, and obviously we had computers um, to see Web 1. But then we started seeing the transition to Web 2, uh, which, I'm, which is where we're sort of now, um, but I'll sort of talk further about that. And that's when we really started to see social networks and engaging peer-to-peer -peer online. Um, and obviously that unleashed social networks. So obviously we, we probably started with MSN Messenger, Friendster, but probably the one that everybody knows is Facebook. And Facebook was really the innovator of that time of driving what Web 2.0 is today. Um, and then that obviously led, moved into what we call the peer-to-peer -peer economy, um, Airbnb, Uber. And now we're sort of on, on the cusp of Web3, um, which obviously what James talked about earlier, about decentralization, but AI-driven services. And we're sort of in that middle now uh, where Web3 is starting to come part of our lives. Obviously, Bitcoin is the key that you think um, of Web 3.0, but we've really expanded a lot further outside of Bitcoin. So um, decentralized networks, um, it's not about having centralization. So obviously Web 2, everything was driven by centralization. So you'd have um, your servers. Um, back in the day, you probably had them located in your office, but then we obviously transitioned to these big cloud networks by the major players like AWS, et cetera. But that's all centralized. But what we're seeing now is that we're moving to Web3, which is this decentralized. And um, it's probably important when I speak to people is that don't think of decentralized as currency. Don't think of decentralized as mem coins like you've heard like Dogecoin, et cetera. They're obviously part of that, but decentralization is a much deeper change. And we're only just on the cusp of that. And obviously AI is supporting that transition. So you're gonna see this big transition now that for our experiences online to be smarter. And what will drive that is AI. So, and you're sort of seeing that now with obviously Alexa, um, all the voice apps, they're now starting to preempt what you're thinking. And that's gonna be the big transition with Web3 over the next 10 years. And especially into business, you're going to see a lot of transformation and there's a huge amount of investment going into that now. Obviously, we've seen Facebook uh, recently announced Meta. Um, they're moving on to the Metaverse as it is. Um, and basically, a lot of AI will be driving this and we're only just, just, just cusping the, the challenge, the power of AI. So obviously, with this huge transition, um, when we started James two years ago, obviously we were thinking Web3. And that's probably been one of the, the biggest um, challenges we've had is that obviously our technology is very early. And so when we promote James, well, not only are we obviously promoting what we do, but we're going through a massive education process with our customers, but also the greater community. But what James is, we are the first AI investing app for retail and wholesale investors. And we were probably the first to use AI a bit differently to, to how everybody sort of thinks that you use AI. So um, just sort of touching quick background on James, we're obviously an AI investing application. Uh, what we do is we analyze a bit over 1000 stocks from the US, Australia, UK and Europe. And we derive buy and sell recommendations. But how we do that is done through our AI technology. Um, and so what we've tried to do is we've tried to, in, in our industry, you do have what we call equity analysts, equity strategists, and they will analyze stocks on a valuation basis or fundamental basis, even technicals. And what we've done is we've trained our AI to think like an analyst. So where, and this is where sort of the education piece comes through because when people sort of see our technology, they think of oh, algorithm. So a, a complex mathematical equation that um, drives alpha. And then obviously with those static algorithms, you generally lose your trading edge. That's what Not James is about. What we're about is we actually use AI to study and understand each individual stock. But with the power of AI and the, the, and the technology we have, we can analyze stocks very, very quickly. And often you'll see our tagline is, is like having a thousand analysts in your pocket. And it really is because we actually analyze stocks every 15 minutes. So, 
as part of this with the AI, we use AI in two ways as part of that uh, recommendation process of the app. And the first one is that we understand sentiment in the market in real time. And so what we do is we have about 250 different news feeds. Um, we have feeds with social media. And essentially we collect from the internet everything that's being spoken about a particular stock. And then we aggregate that data and then we send it through our AI. And what we do is we determine sentiment, so real-time sentiment on a particular stock. We then overlay that sentiment and we benchmark that against their peers, how that sector is, even that market and economic geopolitical events. And then we're able to generate what that sentiment is for that stock. And the second way we do is that we use AI and machine learning logic to track historic movements of that stock. And we collate that all together to derive our recommendations. So this technology, obviously, I'm explaining it. It's probably sounding a bit complex, but um, what we do, the best way to look at it, as I said before, is that it's like having an analyst analyze your stock, not an algorithm analyze your stock. So, sorry, I should have probably jumped the stock a bit earlier. So, obviously, this is a slide just sort of demonstrates what I said before about um, AI and uh, obviously the sentiment side, but this is just how we're using AI. And I think that from our perspective, we're only just really cusping how we're gonna use this technology moving forward. Uh, we're obviously using it in those two ways explained, but I, d I, don't th I don't think us as a company know how much, how far we can push this technology in the future. And I think that's what is the most exciting part of technology transformation, especially in the financial services sector. Um, we're obviously quite a small player, um, obviously compared to the big banks and um, the big investment houses, and they definitely do have this technology, but um, we're all sort of competing against one another, and that's really good because that will drive innovation, no doubt. Um, but, you know, it's pretty exciting about what the transformation will be in the next um, in the next 10 years. So um, that's what we're seeing in, um, from a financial services perspective. And as I said, over the last, it's historically, since, since we started keeping records really 400 years ago, the catalyst for change is technology. Um, it's, you know, in Australia, it's not about how deep we can dig our minds, which sometimes comes across from government because that's where the support is. Um, it's actually technology is that catalyst. And I think it's really important that as businesses, we understand um, what's not only where we've come from, but obviously what's in store in the future so that we can modify and we can adapt our business businesses so we're not left behind. So that's a little bit about how we're, we're using AI and obviously our perspective and what the future looks like. Um, I think it's a very exciting time. And um, yeah, I have any questions if anyone has any. Tui, thanks so much for that. A really interesting platform you've made. And yeah, there's a stack of questions coming through, so we'll get right into it. Uh, from Rosalind Brown, this one I'm actually quite interested in myself. I've recently started delving into crypto just because it seems to be the thing to do at the moment. Um, she <laughs> said, hi, Tui, are you looking at offering crypto trading services? Um, so we're in the investigation process. Uh, we will be doing something around crypto next year. Um, we're working with uh, ASIC at the moment to sort of understand how we can incorporate that into James, but it is definitely something that we're looking at for next year. Is there a potential issue of how volatile each of the coins seem to be? Uh, no, I'm not too worried about volatility. Um, so with James, we aren't a broker, so we have to connect with the broker. Um, so we work with Saxo Markets, Interactive Brokers, CMC Markets. So our ability to offer crypto will probably rely on those companies having adequate supply of cryptocurrencies. Now, obviously, the brokers are sort of going through sort of I know, understanding this change as well. And a lot of it's OTC over the counter sort of products. So um, they're not trading 24 seven like crypto does. So we've got these challenges that we got to look at with the broker that, you know, if the markets are closing at five o'clock and then opening on Monday, 
but you're not trading, we don't have access to those changes. So it's more the accessibility side that we're looking at. Uh, the second way is that we are sort of doing some investigation work at the actual current exchanges. So like Coinbase and, and how they work, but I don't know if anyone sort of traded crypto, you don't just deposit money into an account and then you can just draw down that money. You essentially have to buy a stable coin and then buy a crypto. And if you've got excess cash, you put in a stable coin. So there's essentially all these sort of challenges that we've got to look at as a company. And then the second part is that obviously we, our technology is built for stocks. Um, and it's really, especially the undervalued valuation side. So we're, we're confident in our AI and how we measure sentiment in the market. Um, but we also have to do some work, obviously, on the fundamental side of crypto, because as we know, cryptos are very emotional, they're very volatile as well. So we've really got to understand the effects of fundamentals uh, adverse sentiment in the market. Absolutely. Now, just to add an extra James into the loop here, I'm asking you the question from a James about James. This is going to be very fun. Uh, James Butler says, James seems to be a very interesting platform. Can you talk about the exact way artificial intelligence works and the accuracy of its predictions? Um, so I suppose that we can only go by our own results. Um, so our smart portfolio, which is really our market leading platform portfolio, um, that is where the AI actually picks the stocks for you and determines when to enter and when to sell. So we generally have a high success rate on that uh, circuit or above 60. Um, and then we have our sort of standard product, which runs at about 45% success rate. So that sort of gives you an indication of the two success rates and how accurate it is. But what we found is we've purposely built our algorithms like that as well. So the, the starter and the premium algorithm is what we call, it's really peaky. So what we found is customers like lots of entries and exits um, as a, and then to obviously get the big upside one. So people are prepared to put more risk and actually have more trades opening. And, you know, the results when the AI gets it right is sometimes we can have circa 30, 40% um, increase in the matter of 19 days. Um, and where that algorithm really excels is uh, earnings period or um, announcing, obviously when companies announce their earnings every half year, um, that is when that algorithm absolutely excels because it's jumping in before the announcements when the sentiment's high. Um, and then obviously getting the upside, which is, you know, if it's a good, if it's good earnings report, it can sometimes jump 10 to 15%. The smart portfolio algorithm, though, that runs a lot higher um, is more for your long-term investors. So we actually have a lot of self-managed super funds and sort of wholesale investors who use that platform. And that one's about long, long-term long consistent returns. So the last 12 months, um, we did return 26%. Um, however, our benchmark target for that is 10%. So, And the reason why that one is really popular is that what the AI is very good is at protecting downside, which is what a lot of in investors want, um, especially self-managed super funds. They want to know that the equity is protected when the market falls. But when the market is obviously trending or going up really quickly, we're never, our technology is never ahead of the market. So you always find that we're always a couple percentage behind what the market is doing. But that's a really good mix for that algorithm. Absolutely. Very interesting how it's built. And I think it's something that really does cater itself to, I suppose, potentially maybe even older investors, which is quite interesting given it's a, you know, very much a new forming tech. It's, it's all about minimal risk in many ways, mm. as opposed to, I suppose, millennials who seem to be diving headfirst into cryptos, knowing that it is higher risk, but potentially higher rewards. So it's quite interesting how you've, um, how you've tracked that algorithm. There's another question here from Thomas as well, who says, Tui, obviously the platform is built on AI. To what extent does it continue to grow and learn and make more informed trading decisions? Uh, so every day, basically, we... I can tell you guys a funny story with AI. AI has been a really interesting journey for us. Um, sometimes we will... Uh, put some changes into the algorithm and the AI will obviously use its historic data and actually backtrack our changes. Um, so that's quite interesting in the early days when we were working with our models. Um, but what, yes, we're, we're basically, re, the AI is recalibrating every 15 minutes based off historic results. So 
Um, because the algorithm's been up and running since 2018, um, we're using that historic data, plus obviously we're able to backtrack 20 years. But I think what's important to note with our information is that you can't historically model AI um, data. So we, we pull all that information in real time. So we can't really pull information back from 2000, right? Because we don't have access to social media and things like that. So our AI learning is pretty much based off from when we began in 2018. Um, and that's continually evolving and it evolves in a few ways. So we, we actually note that during earnings period, um, the algorithm sort of changes because um, it we obviously enter in key dates of when earnings periods are happening as well. So the algorithm is able to obviously adapt at that time. You'll find that it's a bit more aggressive in the market. So you'll see that capital allocation is really around that 90% mark. Um, but when the earnings period isn't, it'll probably back down to around even 30, 40%, 50%, depending on what's going on. Currently at the market, I think on the smart portfolio, there's only about 18% uh, of capital allocated so it's quite defensive at the moment so yeah the, the ai is continually changing and evolving and probably every 15 minutes it's it's recalibrating based on historic results that james has produced Look, as long as it doesn't end in skynet i'm pretty happy about it all because i can be quite concerned about robot takeovers but uh, we've got a question <laughs> from an anonymous attendee here who says how credible are the ESG risk rating scores provided by James? Can you talk about the criterion or the process that James uses to calculate such scores? No problem. So we use Sustainalytics to access our ESG data. Um, so that's a firm out of New Zealand. Um, they use their internal process to obviously understand ESG. I can tell you there's probably, you know, five or six main providers in the industry are these providers all getting it right? I don't think so, to be honest. I think they all have different approaches to it. And I think because ESGs sort of just really come into our lives a lot the last 12 months, I think people have different interpretations of if, if that company is meeting ESG or not. Um, Sustainalytics through our research, we feel was probably the best that we found locally. Um, and we use that obviously to identify ESG risk sectors such as coal, um, are they trading in nuclear weapons, animal testing and things like that. Um, they also have a really good scoring system where they, they um, score social governance, um, economic governance, um, things like that. But what we really liked about it, there's a, a field in our app called uh, ESG performance and it gives it a rating under performance average performance and overperformance. And what we liked about that is that it benchmarks that performance of that company against its peers in the market. So we actually think that is more reliable indicator um, of how companies are um, performing in the ESG because, you know, if you're in, in minerals, right, and mining, of course, you're going to have a low impact or compared to everyone else in in, in the market, but can be able to compare it against the peers in that sector gives you more of an uh, understanding of how they're meeting the ESG requirements um, and, you know, what their peers are doing. Just quickly, Tui, before we move on to our final speaker, because we are running a little tight on time, uh, speaking yep. of peers there, are there any direct competitors in terms of automated trading? Uh, not that we're seeing in the market, not how we do it. So you obviously you got a lot of managed fund products out there, even spaceships raise their managed funds. Um, but no one's doing it how where we, we pick the portfolio for you and you connect your broker account. So we're really big on security um, and obviously protecting your money. So by having your money in your chosen broker, um, you know where that money is, the shares are being purchased in your name. So you actually hold those shares um, and it gives you maximum control and liquidity. So no one's taking it from the approach that we are, but there's definitely a lot of managed funds that are using algorithms out there. But again, I don't really know too much if they're incorporating AI technology like we are. As I said, we're doing it very differently to how people think that AI is used in investing. And look, thank you so much for taking the time to answer all those questions. I know we had quite a few and a very interesting presentation. So Tui, thank you so much. No problem. 
Well, that is Mr. Tui Edwera, of course, of the, uh, the CEO and founder of James. And if you didn't get your question answered just then, you can, of course, still send us an email, info at calchimemedia.com. Let's now, though, move on to our final presenter for today. Certainly saving another brilliant expert to wrap things up here. It is the CEO at Zenfi PTY Limited. That's Mr. Vahid Taslimi. Now, Mr. Taslimi has been working in the software industry since the year 2000. And he's been focusing on no-code automation platforms for over the past decade. He also has extensive experience surrounding service as a software platforms on technical as well as the commercial side. And during his career, Mr. Taslimi has had the opportunity to lead various globally distributed product development and product management teams. And as for the company itself, Zenfi is a Google cloud partner that enables quick and easy process automation for making Google workflow simpler. Zenfi empowers its users to automate their process immediately as it has a refined and strong backend secured by an intuitive and easy to use front end. Zenfi is designed and developed on Google Cloud and has been handcrafted specifically for Google. It's a true no-code automation platform for Google itself and also for Google Workspace that eliminates the complexity of coding and maintaining app script by making automation fast and intuitive. Now, there's a lot there to unpack. There's no better way to do it than by speaking to the expert himself and getting all the insights. So, Vahid, welcome to the InvestNest webinar. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. You know, um, thanks for having me here. Um, really enjoyed the last two sessions. Uh, there's a lot to learn and very exciting sessions as well. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Vahid Taslimi and I'm uh, the CEO here at Zenfi. Today, um, I'll be talking to you about, uh, I've, I've got two segments. Not only will I uh, talk to you about Zenfi, but I'm planning to show a little bit of Zenfi as well. So to get it started, um, before talking about Zenfi, I want to take a moment and talk about why we created Zenfi. Okay, uh, for that, I'm going to establish um, a few facts here on here. So first thing is businesses operate based on processes. So no matter what you do, if you're running a business, but it's a small business, big enterprise business, business with a few hundred thousand employees, uh, with, irrespective of the vertical you're working, your business uh, operates based on set of processes. You may have well documented these processes. You may not have done it, but there, there are processes in place. On one hand, you've got the common processes. Uh, like what we like to call them everyday processes. These are your um, employee onboarding. You know, when you hire an employee, what are the steps you need to take? Or when you offboard an employee, what are your steps to take? You need to take. Or for uh, finance processes, which are common across all industries. You know, you need to pay your suppliers. You need to um, do expense approval. On the other hand, you've got processes which are specific to industries like uh, in insurance you've got policy underwriting process in banking you may have account uh, opening or account closure process the fact is that everything is a process if you're running a business okay um that's the first one second one is that i, I believe you know we all agree i'm just calling out again that you cannot um operate a business without digitizing as much as possible uh, if you're not digitizing, even if you're a small business, you're not digitizing, you're not leveraging technology, you'd be risking uh, um, not uh, being there shortly because your competition is going to take over. So your business operation or business processes, they have to be digitized as much as possible. That's the second factor I wanted to establish. However, the third one I want to talk about is that despite of all uh, technology advancements we've had, or we see technology has come a long way. We still see a lot of processes are manual. In fact, McKinsey, based on McKinsey, seventy percent of business processes are still manual. So we're not just talking about the paper based, although it includes them. But see what happens if you uh, receive an email. You need to get the attachment. You know, open it up, extract information, put it in another system. You still, as a person, you're doing this stuff. But it doesn't make sense. And uh, it may take you only a few minutes to do it, but if you do it a lot of times, you know, you'll be wasting a lot of time and money and probably you'll be get frustrated after a short period of time because of it's a, a Monday task. 
And there's a good reason behind all these things. I mean, initially it, it's hard to believe 70% is not automated, but when you start looking deeper into it, you see uh, there's a good reason about it uh, for this one. Uh, first thing is that the whole digitization as automation and automation is really hard using the traditional um, methods. So if you're hiring developers, technical people to write code uh, to automate their processes, um, um, it's going it's time consuming, expensive, and you know, it just there's a lot of misunderstanding. It could be a lot of misunderstanding between. Um, along the same line, IT resources are really uh, expensive and limited. You know, it's a good time to be in a skilled IT resource because your skill sets will be really in demand. And it's not like we haven't the uh, the industries haven't made any advancement. We have there are actually automation tools out there which have made it a lot better than twenty years ago. And these are really great company, multi-billion dollar company, great company. But what happens is that um, those solutions are still catered for uh, technical uh, people and they're expensive. They're, they're still time consuming. They take, surely they take less time than uh, writing the whole thing from scratch up by hiring developer and writing the whole thing, but it's still very time consuming and expensive. So what it means is all those resources get allocated to more strategic um, uh, uh, processes, digitizing more strategic processes, like in, if you're in insurance, you know, uh, probably your uh, claim, or if you're in a bank, your fraud detection, will be prioritized over a lot of other things. All these things uh, come hand in hand that why there's so many manual steps, even in our day to day, we may not really notice them, but there's a lot of them. And that's where Zenfi comes to picture. Zenfi is a, a novel business plat, uh, process platform. It allows you to quickly manage and automate everyday business processes and get insight from your operation. And the best part is that you do all of that without coding. So you really don't need developers. You don't need to be able to write code to do it. Suddenly, um, you've got an army of what we call uh, makers at your disposal. The way Zenfi does it, instead of us trying to create a faster horses, uh, as in like creating a tools for developers, software developers to operate faster. We took a step back and we look at it like we got to create a tool to enable other people who are not necessarily developers in your organization to be able to automate their own processes. At the end of the day, we believe they're the best people to do it because that's their process. They know what they want, so they don't have to communicate it and put it in a queue. How we approach it, we like to say, if you can draw the flowchart of your process um, on a whiteboard, on a piece of paper, back of a napkin, you can, and if you're uh, familiar with computer um, in general, you can uh, most probably automate it with Zenfi. And the way you do it, you don't code, you drag and drop and you configure stuff. I'm gonna show you um, in a moment, but that's the beauty of it. So you just need to know what your process is. And on top of that, as a added benefit, now that everything is digitized, we've made it really, really easy for you to get insight uh, into the black box of your process. It's not a black box anymore for you. You can easily extract key metrics from the execution of those processes and see um, and get insight and try to optimize in them. Like all these things were already possible um, and already happening. But the thing is that you can do it in Zenfi in a matter of hours. And you don't need to bring in a lot of system into, uh, into, into, into the place. You can do it on one platform. That's what we like to say. You're the, true, the only true integrated, no-code, enterprise-grade process platform. Um, so the, the, the reason for that is that we have decided, you know, instead of um, uh, bringing a platform where you I can really become a destination for your employees, for yourself to easily manage and automate uh, your processes and also enable them to participate and get insights. For that, we've got the best of grade workflow automation, uh, uh, no code workflow automation, process documentation, we've got seamless integrated for docu intelligent document processing, AI powered as well, there's another use of AI. Um, we've got document generation, we've got integration with many other systems which um, gives you a lot of very compelling uh, tools, uh, TCO. 
uh, Zenfi itself is a very young company, um, but uh, even in a short time span, you know, there are 700 uh, users who trust in their business operations uh, to be uh, to operate a lot more effectively and efficiently on top of Zenfi, and those are coming from 60 countries already. With that, I want to jump into my presentation and show you uh, Zenfi. That's a, I believe that's the best way. Okay, so the scenario I'm going to show you today is um, our supply invoice uh, uh, routing and approval or accounts payable, which is uh, one of our most commonly used scenarios and everyone can relate to. So the idea is that your suppliers, um, which provide you services or goods, they send you their invoices and your accounts payable team, your finance team needs to open up that invo those invoices, you know, look at the attachment, get the invoices, and then maybe send it to the cost center owner for approval. Okay, now I'll show you how we've done it. It can be done in Zenfi, and then we take it forward from there. So for that, I've created already um, a, a process called accounts payable. If I open up the process, it takes me to the dashboard. Um, I'm gonna come back to the dashboard, but as part of this process, I've created two different, what we call flows, uh, I can show you here, who are participating in this, automating this process. One is to handle the incoming invoices. So they, uh, incoming invoices, they come in, data gets extracted, and then they get a schedule. And also our accounts, uh, there's a batch job, which automatically goes and it starts, uh, acts on the payment of those uh, scheduled invoices. Now, let's, let me look at the, uh, let me take you through the, um, the automation part of it. Uh, this is for the incoming invoices. This is the uh, Zenfi surface. You saw a screenshot of it. And here you, you see all these building blocks where you can use to build a uh, logic if you like to call them actions. The, the only thing you do is that you just drag and drop them from here the way like you building, uh, you're drawing your flowchart. You know, you can drag and drop the, the whatever you need to do. You drag and drop and then you configure the actions. You don't code. You come here and you define stuff, whatever uh, is required for your needs. You've got really powerful uh, logic building uh, um, actions in here, which supports you, your process automation. So for this one, I quickly go through it. So if I've chained a few logics, the email comes through, establish if it's a valid email or not. Then um, we go and uh, based on the sender, we go and look up the, the supplier. And for that, you don't need to go to another platform, although you could if you wanted to, you could go to Salesforce and do it, but we've got an integrated data um, model in Zenfi as well. I, I've already created one of these. This is like a easy to use, to use sheet like database integrated into Zenfi. That is very important. You know, so to keep saying, you don't need to bring in multiple systems all in one place. So I've said, if an email, uh, an invoice comes through from this email address, you know, probably this is the, uh, the cost center, this is the owner and all those things. So going back here, I go and pick it up. Then I start doing a bit of logging and save it to my uh, Google Drive folder. So again, reduce another manual step. So you've delegated the whole thing to Zenfi. Zenfi is watching the email on behalf of you and takes this step on, on behalf of you. And this is where it gets really interesting when we say run AI model. Now that we've got the invoice, uh, let's go and extract information from that invoice. This is normally where, uh, in lack of Zenfi, you one of your team members needs to open up the invoice file, copy paste information, and probably put it into another system. Well, you don't need to do that anymore with Zenfi because it's just as simple as saying selecting an AI model, saying that run this AI model on the invoice which is coming, right? And the way uh, you create AI model, you create it. We don't create it for you. You create it. It just like everything else in Zenfi is just a drag and, a few drag and drop and configuration. Like if I show you our AI builder, I've already created the model here. All you need to do is to upload a sample invoice and uh, identify which fields uh, you, you're interested to extract from the invoice. And here I've identified these five fields. Now the beauty of this thing is that because it's powered by AI and uh, machine learning and it's been trained by millions and millions of invoices, so it doesn't matter the, the structure of your invoice, it, it does its best to extract all those information. So if the due date is instead of here, is down here, or invoice number is called number, it knows it and it does it for you. So you can uh, delegate it all with, to Zenfi. So when it does that, um, then the, the output of it is available for the rest of the flow. And we go and 
what we do is that we send it for approval to a cost center owner. And once approved, we schedule it for payment. I'm gonna run this uh, process once for you and so that you can see it in action. I've already prepared uh, an invoice, um, send it to, to the email. So as soon as I send the invoice, I've configured uh, uh, this inbox. As soon as the invoice lands uh, in this inbox, an, an instance of Zenfi is gonna get it started. So we give a second or two for Gmail to receive the email. Uh, yeah, the email has come through. Let's have a look at the invoice. I just use a sample of the broadband uh, invoice. So it's totally different from the one that uh, uh, we use to train. But you see there's the key information here. Now, if I head back to um, Zenfi, you can see a new instance of that process is kicked up, started. And here I can see all the steps executing, exe being executed, and I can see all the uh, uh, audit log and everything for it. So I can see the steps which have been executed, you know, uh, and I, if I go um, to this table, I should, if I refresh, I should see a new record being added here. As you can see, the, uh, the process company got added and the invoice number and everything got the amount, the dollar value got populated. Now, uh, the next step was to send a, an approval task to the cost center owner. I've configured the same person for a demo uh, purpose to be the cost owner sent, uh, cost owner. So I come here, the invoice again is attached. You can attach it, not attach it. Um, and then I can, only thing as a cost center owner, I can come here, open up the task and um, respond to the task. So um, as you can see, I've dynamically created this one and I say approve. I'm gonna leave any comment, submit, and then what it's gonna do is gonna update this record and mark it as a schedule for payment. So if I refresh it, it should get updated as schedule for payment. So um, uh, yeah, as you can see, it's updated for schedule for payment. So all you can do, all these things, this is, and this is gonna save you a ton of time and your accounts payable team, is gonna, they're gonna love you. They can do it probably on their own. And then um, they can start focusing on more important, uh, more important aspect of the business, doing more important. Can doing something like uh, something like this in Zenfi, you're talking about an hour. You've got another webinar which shows you we build this from scratch up in an hour. But it doesn't end there. We understand, you know, now that uh, the the you've digitized the processes, it's time to get start getting insight, unlock the black box, understand it. So that's where you can come and easily create dashboards. Uh, for different metrics in your process. For example, I created a dashboard for my uh, finance manager to come and see what's happening everywhere, how many invoices are scheduled for payments, how many are waiting for approval. I can do it long and do um, and see how many are in the cost center 8020. I can create a dashboard for my accounts payable team. And they can come here and say, these are the ones actually scheduled for um, payment. I you depending on your need you can provide different visualization of the same data or this one say you know these are the invoices based on the due date we lay them out on a calendar or you can use a popular kanban view of it also as a maybe as a head of finance you may want to see what's the if the uh, cost center owners they're hitting their approval uh, their sla approval sla it doesn't take them two weeks to approve um uh, a, a payment request so you can come here and you see actually our company is not doing pretty well. Our SLA should be down here, but then you can go and say, if you want to see what Owen is doing, you can click on that. On top of that, you can easily create another view for the approvers to see what are the invoices I need to approve. I mean, they get a notified by email, but they can also come here and see the invoices that need to be approved. I want to I wanna uh, emphasize this. These are, you decide what these are, and these are, again, it, building these things are just drag and drop. Like for this process, maybe these are important. If I go to another process, like for example, for NDA process, you know, we may have a different set of metrics altogether. You may wanna uh, visualize our process uh, execution map, or you may wanna see number of requests coming by, um, uh, by location. So you can easily, really, really easily enable your employees to automate their own processes and digitize the whole operation 
with a few drag and drops. You're not asking them to be citizen developers. You're not asking them to go and learn how to code. Just asking them to actually think about the process and with a few drag and drop, be enable you to do that and also gain a lot of insight from um, the executions of, the, of those processes. So um, with that, I, I've, I'll open up any questions. If there's any questions, I'm, um, I'm happy to answer the questions. Thanks so much for that, Vahid. I'll just get you to stop sharing that presentation itself. I dare say you uh, you enjoyed playing with Lego when you were growing up with all the different options that you could try and create things based on this, didn't you? I did. I did. It, it is good. It, it, it is similar. You've got the building blocks, what we call them Lego blocks. You chain them together. You actually come up with a very sophisticated system. It, it is indeed very sophisticated. There's so many different options to play with, and we also have plenty of questions to get to as well. So this is great to see. Uh, every one of these presentations has definitely been attracting a lot of attention. Let's start with Angelica, who says, what are the business processes that Zenfi can currently be integrated into? And what are the other opportunities that you're exploring? Um, sure. I mean, um, you, you saw the list of processes out there. You pretty much can automate uh, any day-to-day -day business process right, uh, and be integrated with many other systems. You understand, you know, companies operate, they've got multiple systems, they've got Salesforce and they've got HubSpot and they've got e-signature and all those things. So Zenfi integrates with uh, pretty much all of the major uh, uh, players out there. And um, uh, that was the first part. Um, um, sure, we, we see how we go actually uh, in terms of diversifying into the, um, uh, in terms, what was the second question? Sorry, I, second part of the question. So the second part of the question was, what are the other opportunities that you're exploring? Uh, we're just exploring everything that we can do based on the market feed that we get to enable even uh, companies operate even more effectively and efficiently. So um, just making it available to a new breed of people or organization has been our focus. And we, uh, we, we're pushing forward with that. That's been very, very received. Lovely. Now, I think Sandra might be someone who's uh, very wary of big tech based on her question that she also posed towards TUI with crypto as well. And we've also got this one from her. How can I be sure about the security and privacy of my data while working with Zenfi? Um, sure. So one, one thing we did, one of the benefits of being a young company, uh, we built uh, Zenfi from ground up with privacy and security requirements of the current day and age in mind. Um, so we take all the major security, uh, oh, not all the major, basically all the security requirements that you can see we've got, that's where we've got different data centers, you know, uh, each uh, company gets its own encry uh, encryption key, everything's double encrypted. Um, we're really going to all of the, uh, those and then uh, soon ISO certification also uh, will be coming up very soon. Um, so yeah, we pretty much um, take a, um, all the security requirements of the an enterprise system. And the other thing we've done, we've made it available to everyone. So we haven't kept it for a specific tier, like for a companies, the big companies, the same function the security functionalities are available to everyone in our platform. We, we're not monetizing security. That's, uh, that's one of the things we decided to do from day one. Wonderful. Well, uh, John also says, really insightful show, Mr. Vahid. Can you talk about the prerequisites that an ongoing business should have for beginning to use Zenfi across processes? Um, sure. The, the first thing you want to do is that it, it, you have a look at uh, around your business and see the things that are repetitive tasks, right? And um, you kind of start you, uh, with those ones, you, but really you don't have a prerequisite as in like you don't really need developers, you don't need technical knowledge, um, you just kind of get it started. If anything, we always suggest start, uh, select a small uh, process, start with a small process, but take one step at a time. So what, what we've seen is that people normally, our customers do one a small process. They see, oh, it's pretty cool. I can do all this thing. Then they start doing 10,000 other things at the same time, but they've got other business priorities as well. So we say take one step at a time till you find your own, what works best for you. Because at the end of the day, your situation is unique to you. Lovely. Uh, Thomas has also said, 
How has the recent COVID-19 led situation affected the company? Is Zenfi planning to diversify into new markets, products or businesses? Um, sure. I mean, the COVID has been an accelerator for pretty much everything uh, out there in terms of digitized, uh, digital digitization. Uh, there's a ton of uh, use cases coming through, even from Australia. You know, uh, you see when you're going back to office now, um, some companies, they require to have rapid tests and take a photo, upload it and do this thing and email it to someone. So we've had uh, customers, you know, automating all those processes. Again, in a matter of hours, they automate it, put it on autopilot. Or in Victoria, like, uh, because I'm based in Victoria, uh, up until a while ago, if you were um, uh, uh, essential worker, you wanted to go to work, you had to request a permit. And we saw a lot of companies uh, quickly automating those on Zenfi using, um, using uh, e-signature and all those things, generating the document. So there's been an accelerator. You had people started working from home. A lot of companies did not have work from home policies in place. So you had to put a policy, get them signed by your uh, staff. That was it. Now some companies are going back to office. Now again, you got to put in some other policy, get them signed. Now all those the small, small things, but then there's you, you don't want to send them to three or 400 employees and manage them manually. You want to create a system to do it. And that we've seen a lot of usage of Zenfi on those ones. Ultimately, that would just save a lot of time and I suppose potentially even uh, money in terms of employing extra people to go through all these invoices, for example. Absolutely. It's, it's, uh, it's all about you know, um, uh, having competitive, uh, increasing your co cooperative efficiency, right? Mm. Uh, so you can free up your people, they can focus on the more important stuff, uh, whether it's your finance people or whether it's your legal team creating NDAs you can free them up to focus on more important stuff. Uh, the second is that you can uh, create a comp uh, have a, a be competitive. So if you're a bank, um, you want to bring a new loan product to market and it has to be digital. But if you're hiring developers to create the digital side of it, then it's going to take you four months, six months. You probably another bank's going to uh, win the um, uh, bank competition. And ultimately, one thing is extremely important is the employee retention and happiness and retention. So if you've got employees who are doing the mundane task, you know, uh, the first chance they get, they're going to move. You want to keep your employees happy. You want to keep your employees uh, around because that's, that's the most important aspect of uh, pretty much all the businesses. So by taking away all those mundane, repetitive tasks, uh, there's heaps of studies done that uh, um, you create a happier environment and you increase your employee retention. Yeah, I, I think anyone wants to be doing menial tasks constantly, do they? Yeah. They want to be challenged and doing something that feels like it's working towards a greater purpose. Final question for you coming from John Corbett. Simply says, where are you on the web? I think we can take this in two ways to find out. One, where can we find Zenfi? Uh, yeah. And also how, how can it be utilized? Is it just within the confines of Google or could it potentially also work in Safari, for example? Uh, um, so yeah, sure. Well, Zenfi.com, where you can you can find us, or just Google Zenfi, it comes up. And uh, now it's it's it was initially it was purpose built for Google Workspace, but now if you're not a Google Workspace user, you can also use Zenfi as well. Lovely. Well, Vahid, thank you so much for the presentation, answering all those questions as well. No problem. Thank you for having me. Now, whilst we still got you here, we'll kick things off with you first. Uh, final words we want to hear from you in terms of how you see Australia's tech future playing out and what is our tech advantage as we begin to come out of COVID? How can the products that we've talked about today, Zenfi, for example, really help to shift that momentum moving forward into a, a new, I suppose, Web 3.0 world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it's, uh, COVID, one of the things it did, I mean, we all know it, it expedited the digital transformation by like five years. These things were all bound to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, it just COVID expedited it by like say five years. So things are happening a lot faster. We're in a good spot in Australia, but we need to do more for sure. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of movement along tech sectors from various aspects of the tech. Um, and uh, I think that's gonna give us a competitive advantage in that we have to, if you, uh, uh, I think it was James was saying that it's not about the coal or anything in a, in a I don't know, after five, 10 years, probably the technology is going to be the main driver and a winner for us as a country. 
Lovely. We'll jump straight from you, Vahid, here to Tui. Tui, welcome back to uh, the floor here. Now, as part of your presentation, you were looking sort of at the history of how, I suppose, the web has developed from its early functions back in, say, the 1990s, and then obviously the dot-com boom, and then shifting to social media, and now obviously Web 3.0 has arrived. What does the future have in store for, for Australia with its, its tech self, I suppose? Well, I think um, I think over the next 10, 20 years, you're actually going to see technology be the biggest sector in Australia. Um, it's obviously not at the moment mining resources is, is our number one export, but I think Australia is in a good position um, that we can become that technology leader globally. Um, obviously, we're seeing NBN roll out more faster, but I think 5G will probably end up taking that over over time anyway. But by having the infrastructure in place, um, I think technology will have a huge influence. And I think you'll see hopefully a transition from governments thinking um, as well to invest more into this sector. Like it always hurts me when I hear every year they cut back the R&D grant. And even mm. though the R&D grant's proven for every dollar it spends, it puts $4 back into the economy. So, you know, that's where our investment needs to be. And I think, obviously, we've got climate change. We've got targets at the moment. And the Prime Minister has come out and said that technology is going to be the way to hit those targets. Um, <clears throat> technology will, will play a large part. Obviously, we do need to look at, you know, how we can lower our emissions generally as a society, but um, you're going to see this huge, you know, as I said, we're moving into what we call Web 3.0. Um, you're going to see greater decentralization of technology, in particular um, applications that we use on a daily basis. And I even think that you're going to see more disruption through decentralization, such as charities and things like that as well, not for profits, because, you know, the biggest so it's a bit cloud. People will have this perception of non-profits that if you put money into that, um, into that non-profit, is it actually getting down to the front? Um, so you know you're going to see technology and especially decentralization organizations start having huge influence, and I think that's going to drive the technology innovation for us moving forward. Tui, I really like the point you raised there about the charity side of things. Of course, Elon Musk recently has come out and said, yeah. "I'm willing to." to sell off $6 billion worth of stock if you can tell me exactly where it's going to go. And I think that is the next step. Web 3.0 is about decentralization, then also transparency about the processes that go on. So, yeah, you've hit the nail on the head with that one. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, you've just heard crickets since Musk uh, said that, haven't you? Like, they haven't responded. And I think I think it is something that, you know, we need to look at harder because, you know, with, with technology will come um, more divide, I think, as well, like the, the poverty gap will widen and we do need to make sure that we're not leaving people behind. Um, so, if you know, if we are donating to those causes, I think it's really important that, you know, we know that money is getting there. And, you know, if we can cut out the politics through decentralised organisations where, um, you know, I think a big trend next year is going to be what we call DAOs, decentralization, autonomous organizations, which is really mm. present in the crypto, I think that's going to continue. And I think there's a lot of sectors that are going to be disrupted and changed because of this, this change. Absolutely. And Rakesh, we'll give the final word to yourself. How do you see Australia's tech future playing out? And as Tui mentioned there, it could even cause potentially uh, wider rifts in terms of the, the income from lower socioeconomic households to to medium class or sorry should i say middle class and even the upper class is there a way for example that your drone technology can assist in 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 such things as well i think that's where uh, you know this platform really really help right wherein we indirectly we're providing employment pro probably uh, divide the gap between the rich and the poor um i mean now it's it's the days of multiple jobs multiple employment um mm especially with the COVID, you know, nobody, most of them, they just don't want to stick to uh, one job. We, we're talking about the great uh, resignation and all of that, right? Uh, I think this is where, um, uh, you know, someone like us, especially if you're a drone hobbyist or pilots provide, you know, multiple ways of, um, you know, uh, an opportunity to earn, monetize your free time, but also give you time to like you know you like what you're doing right you you want to fly drones um one thing you stressed about was um using drones for giving back like search and rescue you know not everybody is looking and monetizing they want to just give back in whatever way it's possible and this is where i think uh, our platform will um you know really help 
bridge the gap uh, between, you know, uh, between, you know, rich and the poor, as well as each one of us, you know, giving back to the community. Just one final thing about tech. I think we are greatly placed in Australia, uh, wherein, as I keep saying, we can incubate uh, the technology. Uh, you know, we have seen Atlassian on the afterpace of the world, um, you know, unicorns. So we are greatly placed. We have highly skilled talent. Uh, universities are doing, you know, heaps of research. If I talk about uh, drone, um, such a vast country, we can, uh, you know, get into testing drones um, in some of these remote areas before we actually take this technology um, to, uh, to other countries. Absolutely. Next stop is Silicon Valley overtaking them. That's what we want to see. That is for sure. But final time, Rakesh, Fahid and Tui, thank you so much for your time today, guys. Thank you. No problem. Wonderful. Look, brilliant presentations from you all. Thank you so much for answering all the questions too and your final thoughts. If you didn't have a question answered today and you would like it done, final time, just head across to info at calkindmedia.com. We'll forward those questions on. We'll make sure we get an answer from one of our experts, whoever it might be. Just make sure in your title, you're asking exactly who you want us to put that towards. And uh, I know we did get through a plenty of questions, but there might still be a few coming through. But thank you so much, all of our esteemed guests for presenting today and also for joining us in hearing those wonderful presentations. That gives us a wrap for this edition of yet another insightful InvestNest webinar from Calkine. If you do want to keep up to date with what we're doing, we do have a live broadcast product running from nine to five. That's Calkine TV. And for all extra information, you can just head across to our website, calkinemedia.com. Right. Well, that is all done and dusted. Hope you enjoyed the webinar. I'm James Preston. And I'll catch you next time.